Uh, well, let's speak to, as I described him, the man himself, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, joining us at from Middlesbrough. Great to see you this morning, Chancellor. Um, in terms of the budget, morning, it strikes Neil. that it was perhaps a, a kind of a tale of two halves. There was plenty within it about the road to prosperity, one eye on the future, uh, but also quite a bit on how we pay for it. We'll deal with the second in a, sec in a second, but, but just in terms of the announcement on freeports, which is why you are standing where you are, what will these seven freeports be able to do that the eight that we shut down in 2012 were not? So what we announced yesterday, Neil, were eight free ports in eight English regions across the country. And what free ports are, they are special economic zones which have different rules that are going to attract jobs, investment and trade to places like Teesside, where I'm now standing. And I'm incredibly excited about what this means. We said we would level up opportunity across the country. Free ports are an example of us doing that. It's a policy that we can now fully pursue in a unique British way now that we've left the European Union. And we've had great reaction to it. We had lots of people bidding to be free ports and in areas like this where steel was a fantastic industry of the past and as we look forward, you know, my, my vision for the future of a place like this is Teesport can be the place where we do carbon capture and storage, offshore wind, we're already manufacturing vaccines here. All of that can happen inside a free port with special tax planning and investment uh, and that's creating jobs across the country. So it's an exciting agenda. It certainly is, but do, do you share any of the EU's concerns when it comes to free ports and the way that they can somehow be used, sometimes be used to, to circumvent the tax system? I mean, I don't know if you've seen the film Tenet. I have. I understand barely a word of it. The one thing that leapt out, though, was the ability of high, net earn, of high wealth individuals to use free ports to conceal some of their wealth. Well, actually, free ports are used extensively across the world. Uh, and the, the EU is actually one of the few places that, that doesn't use them extensively. Everywhere else uh, does. For example, in, in America, there are over 200 of them employing close to half a million people. And of course, all free ports, and especially the ones here in Britain, will be ones which we agree with all the OECD rules around tax and making sure that customs facilitations all happen in an orderly manner following all the rules. So I don't think anyone has anything to worry about on that. Uh, front, but what they will do is attract businesses to locate with the tax incentives, invest in, in new equipment, uh, new plants here, create jobs in places like Teesside or Southampton or Liverpool, uh, and I think that's exciting. Um, can we uh, talk then about the, the freezing of um, personal tax thresholds? And, uh, and to your credit, you did not shy away at the dispatch box yesterday for spelling out exactly what this will mean to people. I mean, you couldn't have done much more short of wearing a baseball cap with this will cost you money written on it. And everyone understands that we all have our part to play in, in getting the nation's economy back on track. But at the same time, isn't it pretty clear that if everyone who is paying tax will have to pay more in tax, the people who will feel that most keenly are those who have least to start with? So, in terms of the budget yesterday, Neil, I think you alluded to this in, in your intro, I think the first part of the budget was to make good on the promise that we would do whatever it takes to protect people and businesses through the remaining stages of this crisis. Uh, and the budget announced an enormous amount of extra support, for example, extending furlough through to September, lots more cash support for businesses as we exit the restrictions. That's the right thing to do now, and that's why uh, we did that yesterday. But I also wanted to be honest with people, honest with the country, about the challenges that coronavirus has caused us, particularly in our public finances. Uh, and I don't think it would be right or straight to ignore those, let them be someone else's problem to fix, which is why we set out a plan to address that. But importantly, sure, but there, but you know, the steps in that plan yes. don't, don't the, come into it. They, they don't come into effect straight away and they protect I, public services and working people. But, but there's, there's a question of priorities in all this, which was what I was alluding to in the question. It's why we're choosing to balance this off the back of, of everyone rather than, for example, the huge number of high net worth individuals who have done pretty well out of this pandemic. Why is, why is someone, for example, I mean, one, 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 one of the uh, estimates, uh, and there are plenty in the paper, so please challenge it, but it's wrong. But if you're earning £11,500 now, by 25-26, inflation could mean you're earning a salary of £13,500. You'll go from paying no income tax to paying £186. Now, I understand to you and me that might mean the price of a coffee mug. To other people, that's the cost of their kids' shoes for the year. So, actually, freezing personal tax thresholds, Neil, is a progressive way to raise money. I think, crucially, what people need to understand is no-one's current take-home pay that they have today 
is affected or lowered by this policy. What it does do is remove the incremental benefit that they might have experienced in the future as inflation fed through to their wages. But their current cash take-home pay isn't affected. And also, crucially, those on higher incomes are affected more by this policy. It's a very progressive policy, and that's something that has been noted by independent think tanks that are respected, like the Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, and others, who have, who have made the point that those, the richest 20% of households, for example, will end up contributing, I think, about 15 times more than those on the lowest incomes. That's why this is a fair way to help solve the problems that we need to. But crucially, no one's cash take-home pay is affected, and it doesn't come into force just now because we want to support the recovery in the short term as we are doing. Sure. Uh, there will be those who agree that it is progressive. Surely it would have been made more progressive by the fact if, if you had, for example, protected those at, at the bottom end, not stuck a freeze on them. I mean, we're talking about a million more people paying tax which is a significant increase. We're talking about perhaps a, a million more people, I mean, million and uh, 1.3 million perhaps paying at the 40% rate. I mean, that includes teachers, nurses, plenty of people like that. How would you describe people who will be on that 40% so, uh, tax rate? Would you describe them as well off? Well, you, you talked, first of all, you know, about people on, on lower incomes. I think it's important to remember our personal allowance at just over 12 and a half thousand pounds is by far and away the most generous personal allowance anywhere in the G20 group of large uh, countries. So we start from the position that that is already the most approach to the most generous approach to those on lowest incomes out of basically any other major country in the world. We've doubled that personal allowance over the last 10 years, saving those on lower incomes over a thousand pounds. And also the other things that we're doing to help people on lower incomes, for example, increasing the national living wage from April of this year above inflation at a difficult time. But that's because we want to support those on lower incomes and that will mean a pay rise of around 350 pounds for someone working full-time on the national living wage starting in april so we do remain committed to that and we start in a strong place with the highest most generous personal allowances pretty much anywhere else you can find it is a common theme of interviews with, with particularly conservative chancellors but with chancellors to ask them to to rule out tax rises now given that this freeze you as announced in the budget yesterday is due to be in place until 2025 2026 i wonder if we can turn it on its head can you promise that there will be no income tax cuts this side of the next election well uh, well, what, what, what I am going <laughs> what, what to say is, is we're just talking about this budget for now, Neil. And, and in terms of this budget, you're, you're right. Well, I made some that choices. You set out yesterday, we talked to be about. Fair, we talk about. But we took. Yeah, but we talk about the, the allowance freeze. And then the other decision we made is to ask large companies in two years' time to also play their part in helping us uh, fix the problem. And I made those choices, uh, as I explained yesterday, specifically because I wanted to protect working people from increases in their tax rates. So we honoured our manifesto commitment. Not to increase the rates of tax on national insurance, income tax or VAT. Uh, that was important for me to do. And we also wanted to crucially protect public services and protect small businesses. And that's why I believe the two measures we set out yesterday, you know, they are the right measures, they're fair and they will support our economic recovery. Sure. J just in terms of the corporation tax rise from 19 to 25 per cent over the over the next few years, um, I mean, is this you, you basically turned a, a kind of a decade of conservative orthodoxy on corporation tax on its head? We've been told that, you know, if you raise corporation tax, you restrict growth. If you cut it, you increase growth. I mean, is this the end of, of the party's obsession with with the Laffer curve? I mean, certainly there are plenty of businesses this morning that are not laughing. Well, if you look at our corporation tax rate, it's important that it's internationally competitive, Neil. So even after this increase, we will still have the lowest corporation tax rate of, of what's called the G7 countries, the large economies that we compete with around the world, America, Canada, Germany, Italy, uh, France. So we will have the lowest corporation tax rate even after this increase compared to all of them. Uh, we are also exempting small businesses. We're protecting them from the increase. So 70% of businesses won't be affected by the increase at all. Uh, so we want to protect small business. And also we want to support business in the 
short term to invest and help drive our recovery. So what I announced yesterday was something called the super deduction. It's a tax cut for business investment, the likes of which we've never tried before in this country. And I'm hopeful that it will spur businesses to invest in new free ports like Teesside, where I am today, as we've discussed. And that will help drive our recovery, create jobs and support businesses to do exactly that completely understand that, but of all the SME owners that have been in touch with me over the past 24 hours, and there have been plenty of them, the one point that all of them make is this. What about those big companies, the tech giants, that have done exceptionally well out of all of this? I mean, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter, these, these big organisations, where has been the focus on them in all of this? They've done incredibly well, and frankly, some of them won't even be paying 5% tax on their earnings. So, so, Neil, remember, corporation tax is a tax on profits. So, by definition, businesses that are doing well and making profits pay, pay a good amount of tax, uh, which is as it should be. But you're right to highlight uh, online companies. Now, and the reality is, the way our tax system works, it makes it difficult to tax these large global tech companies, which is why in last year's budget, I introduced something called the digital services tax, uh, where we've levied a percentage uh, charge on their turnover uh, because we can't tax them in the way that we would like to. Uh, that's already taking force and what we are doing now is working with our international partners around the world. Uh, we are in charge of something called the G7 group this year so I'm leading that charge with finance ministers around the world to reach an international agreement on how to tax these large uh, tech companies properly because that involves all of us to agree a set of rules so we can, we can approach it in a common way. But in the short term we have got a digital services tax which is doing exactly what you, you've uh, suggested and we will replace that with an international agreement, hopefully this year, uh, as we work with our other partners. At, at the heart, though, of this budget pitch was, was this claim, and, and it has been made a number of times over the course of the pandemic by you and a number of other cabinet ministers, that you'll do whatever it takes to help the British people uh, through this crisis. Where was the support for, for the excluded yesterday? We understand that, yep, yeah, uh, those who are recently self-employed uh, will be pretty pleased that there will be an opportunity for them to get some more money, of course, after 12 months of not getting anything. But PAYE freelancers, limited company directors, those denied furlough, they're still not recognised. I'm sorry to, to kind of bang on about this, but I just want to read you a couple of tweets that we've had. Chris Davis is the director of a limited company. He says this, I can't even begin to explain the anger I'm feeling right now. I'm so angry I'm shaking. I've lost my wife, my kids, my house, my business, my savings. I'm done. Stephen Gray was on the show yesterday. What do you suggest is someone excluded because they earned a tad over 50k before the pandemic but is now down to 80% and still excluded? What should they do to put food on the table? The, the mantra that you have done everything you could to help everyone who is in need of help is demonstrably untrue, Chancellor. So, uh, so, Neil, I, I couldn't hear all the details of everything you said, but what I would say is we made a major improvement in access to our self-employment scheme yesterday. Uh, and it was frustrating last year. We, we weren't able to bring in newly self-employed people because we, they hadn't all filed their tax returns. Now that the tax return deadline has passed, uh, we were able to announce that all those people, it will be more than 600,000 new people will be able to benefit from the fourth and fifth self-employment grants uh, that will be in place over the coming months. That's good news uh, and welcome. And I appreciate that people haven't felt that they've been able to get the help they want in exactly the way they want in the time they want. But this is only one element of the support that we've put in place. So, for example, we've talked already about universal credit, support with people's rent through something called local housing allowance, mortgage holidays, bounce back loans, a support that we've given to local authorities that they can use at their discretion to support their local businesses. So there's lots of different things that we are doing. And if you take a step back and you look at the, the budget book yesterday, what it shows is that over the course of this crisis, we will have spent over £30 billion pounds supporting those who are in self-employment. And I, I'm confident that that will stand as one of the most generous approaches to supporting self-employed people anywhere in the world.